The book Blood of Tyrants examines George Washington's role as commander of the Continental Army and now the views of the Founding Fathers shaped how the U.S. conducts itself in war. The author discussed his book at Yale Law School for just over an hour. Good evening. Uh, my name is Blair Kaufman. I'm the director of the Yale Law Library, and I'm here to welcome you to the Lillian Goldman Law Library book talk series. I also want to thank the Federalist Society for co-sponsoring tonight's talk. Tonight's program features Logan Byrne, who is the author of a new book on America's first chief executive entitled Blood of Tyrants, George Washington and the Forging of the Presidency. This is very much a Yale Law School book. It began as a paper while Logan was a law student. The paper was written under the supervision of Professor William Eskridge. After graduation from law school in 2008 and working two years in the Sullivan Cromwell law firm, Logan returned to the Yale Law School uh, in 2010 as an Olin scholar and began turning the paper into the book that we feature tonight. Appropriately, we have Professor Eskridge with us to comment on the book. Professor Eskridge is a highly distinguished member of the Yale Law School faculty. He's the author of numerous case books, monographs, and law review articles covering a wide range of legal topics. And several of his books have been featured in previous book talk series sponsored by our library. According to a recently published study by my colleague Fred Shapiro, Professor Eskridge is one of the most cited legal scholars in the known universe. Just uh, one or two others have been cited more than Professor Eskridge, and I think that was probably a mistake. Uh, last but surely not least, Professor Eskridge is a dynamic and innovative teacher and a wonderful mentor to young scholars like Logan. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Logan. All right, thank you very much. And I'd like to add that Professor Bill Eskridge here is particularly fitting for this talk because he is a descendant of George Eskridge, who is the godfather of our nation. When Mary Ball, George Washington's mother, was orphaned at 13, George Eskridge took her in. And in gratitude for this, she named her firstborn son after him. So thank you, thank you for coming today. <laughs> uh, our, oh, now wait a minute, now, uh, now Logan Byrne, that, he's quite right, but Logan Byrne <laughs> is also the descendant of distinguished forebearers who have a relationship to George Washington. Uh, as most of you know who know any of the history of George Washington, George Washington participated in the French and Indian War. That was probably his first real military experience. And one of the officers serving under him, in fact, the most decorated officer serving under him, was Officer Dandridge, who was a lineal ancestor of Logan Byrne, I believe on his mother's side, uh, and indeed, after an important battle, uh, one of the few battles that George Washington actually won <laughs> uh, against, uh, he turned over the sash of General Braddock to his trusted and uh, uh, decorated officer, Officer Dandridge. And we have that sash here today, <laughs> which we will award to Logan Byrne. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The Braddock Sash. Okay, which makes Logan Byrne a very appropriate author for today's book. Although they carry Braddock's body in it, so I might take it off. <laughs> um, I, it's funny because Professor Eskridge and I, our families go back a long way to colonial Virginia. In fact, the last time that we sat around speaking, our two families, about politics, it started a revolution. So are we sure this is safe? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Yale Law School is a hotbed of rest. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> That's true. Um, so, so this ancestry and heritage comes into this book quite a bit. Uh, mine being uh, revolutionary heritage, but also I'm fascinated by the fact that each and every one of us has a rich family heritage. And I think it's important that we remember that and learn from it. And this book itself is actually on our national collective heritage and what we might learn from the founders when they were forging what it meant to be the American commander in chief during the Revolutionary War. So 
this book actually started way, way back. When I was very young, my father would take us to a reenactment of the Battle of Lexington every year without fail. And it would be a freezing cold uh, morning in April, and we'd be watching these reenactors put on a little battle. My favorite part was the breakfast afterwards. We would go to uh, this little restaurant, and it was wonderfully hokey. The, the, uh, the waiters and waitresses would dress up in period costumes, and they would act um, the role of different patriots. My father, having a very dry sense of humor, he would torture the man dressed as Washington and try to make him break character. It was, it was very hysterical. And eventually, the guy every year would laugh, eventually. So fast forward about a, a decade or two later, I'm sitting in Professor Eskridge's constitutional law class. And you're describing uh, Article 2, Section 2, the Commander-in-Chief Clause. All that it says is that the president shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy. And it doesn't say much more. However, presidents throughout history have cited this commander-in-chief power for various um, means, whether it's um, prisoner torture, military commissions, um, power vis-a-vis -vis Congress. All sorts of powers have been read into this clause. So you said, too bad we can't ask the founders what they had in mind. I instantly thought of that waiter. And I thought, why don't we just ask him? <laughs> and I did the next best thing. I actually went to the library where Teresa helped me go through the tomes of primary sources and um, the excellent collection that we have here of documents and diaries and newspaper clippings and really getting a, a thorough look at what these founders were saying to one another and what they believed and understood the term American Commander-in-Chief to mean. Um, sure enough, I kept on working on it, and I turned to my first draft. Um, do you remember what you said? Well, I like the title. It was George versus George <laughs> versus George. You, you and did. I think the Georges were George Washington, George III, and George W. Bush. That's right. That's right. I was comparing the three. And you, and you did like the title, but you asked for more. So I, I, here, here's more. <laughs> um, so I kept on working and eventually evolved um, into the, the book that we, that we have coming out in the, in the next couple of weeks. And what really struck me when I was doing my research initially was a quote from Washington where he said, the foundation of our empire was laid not during a gloomy age of ignorance and superstition, but during an epoch when the rights of mankind were better understood and more clearly defined. In this auspicious period, the United States came into existence as a nation, and if their citizens shall not be completely free and happy, the, the fault will be entirely their own. Wow, I, thought, I saw that as a personal challenge to each and every one of us to learn about this auspicious period and understand what was happening in that epoch to see when the founders got together after the Revolutionary War to write the Constitution, they were, who was at the front of the, uh, the front, front and center as the president of the Constitutional Convention, but George Washington, the commander in chief, who had led them through the struggle and he had forged and defined what it meant to be the American commander in general, and really the, the presidents, um, that they were creating with this constitution. Everyone knew that George Washington would be the first president. In fact, when it came time to elect him, he received every single vote. Um, so as I was you know, researching this book, I came across all sorts of fascinating and um, really juicy and some somewhat scandalous stories, some of which sounded like um, they were headlines from today. Um, regarding torture, regarding uh, military commissions. We, we see we're still discussing the mastermind of 9-11 10 years after his capture and what rights does he deserve. Well, they were, they were debating the same things back then. Um, or even uh, Congress, Congress sort of meddling in the president's war powers. That was, a, that was a big discussion 
during the Revolutionary War as well. So today I like to start off, and hopefully I get into some of the other stories as well, but I'd like to start off with one story in particular because I think it helps to establish um, a, a reoccurring principle that I, I found time and time again um, while writing this, and that is the divide uh, between the President and the Commander-in-Chief's power over foreign nationals and defending us from uh, foreign forces versus his power over uh, American citizens and sort of what power does he have to defend us from one another. So it really, the story begins at a small bend in upstate New York in the river, the Hudson River. And right now when you think of West Point, you think of well manicured lawns, you think of our nation's uh, future military elite rushing to and from classes, you think of monumental sized buildings. You don't realize that back in 1780, it was a fledgling little fort that really held the fate of the nation. Basically, the British were interested in capturing the entire Hudson River because they were wanting to cut off the rebellious New England states, states from the rest of the nation. And that would effectively, as George Washington said, that would end the revolution if they were able to do so. So what the Americans did, not having a navy ourselves, we constructed a land-based defense. Now, Benedict Arnold, he, he knew how valuable this was. So he concocts a plan to sell it for approximately 26 million in US dollars today. And where the story gets most interesting, everyone knows about Benedict Arnold, but the story gets most interesting when you look at his co-conspirators who, who are less known. John Andre, he was uh, British um, head of intelligence under General Clinton. And then uh, loyalist Joshua Het Smith. So when it came time for Benedict Arnold to betray his, his country, he met with John Andre to formulate the plan of attack and give him the, the plans of West Point and let him know where might you be best attack from in order to quickly, quickly win. And they met um, on the side of the Hudson, down, down river from West Point in a, a wooded area. And they, they were bickering the whole night about how to best do things. I mean, you've heard of Arnold, you could see how he's, he was sort of a, um, not a very amenable fellow. And he was still squabbling about the price, he was going on and on. But sure enough, the sun comes up while they're still talking. And the um, Andre's ship is fired upon when the Patriots see it. And so he's trapped. So Arnold says, okay, Smith, Andre, let's go back to Smith's house and we'll figure out another way to get you back to safety in British controlled New York City. So they get back to the house and Arnold says, quick, put on Smith's jacket. This will disguise you, so you'll, everyone will think that you're an American. And Smith, do me a favor and ride with him back down to New York City, make sure he's safe. So everything seems great, they're, they're, they ride along, and um, they come to about Terrytown um, in Westchester. And Smith, by this point, is, he's pretty tired. He had been up the whole night, a couple nights before, and he wants to go back and sleep. So he turns around. Sure enough, six miles after they part, Andre is jumped by some militiamen. And they, they um, frisk him, they strip search him, and they find the plans to West Point in his boots. Quickly, the whole uh, plan starts to unravel. And Arnold gets wind of this, and he escapes. He gets away, and he, um, then Washington finds out and he quickly sends his men to get Joshua Head Smith. Now what's very striking is he has, so Washington has at his disposal at this point, John Andre, the British officer, and Joshua Head Smith, the American citizen, the loyalist, involved in the exact same plot. They both have damning evidence against them. And in fact, he says to Smith, when he's interrogating him, he says, 
I have enough evidence to hang you on yonder tree. Um, but he doesn't. He doesn't hang him on yonder tree. Instead, for Smith, he provides him with uh, a court-martial, which is a type of military trial um, dating back to the 13th century, King Richard I, in which there are some safeguards and there's an element of due process to make sure that the accused has, has a fighting chance to defend themselves. And, the, and the, um, the panel is charged with actually deciding whether this man is guilty or not. So after about, I think it was four weeks of trial, Smith has, a, has damning evidence against him. They have all these witnesses that are testifying to seeing sort of the familiarity between Andre and Smith and also showing the coat that Smith had used to disguise uh, a British officer, which is a big no-no. Um, and despite that, they, at the end of the, end of the trial, they realize that because he is an American, he has a high burden of proof. And we need to prove that he knew what he was doing was wrong. And they couldn't. With that high burden, he was acquitted. People were shocked. In fact, they were so shocked that the, um, the civilian authorities took him in back to prison on other charges. So since that, those didn't stick, there, they had others for him. Um, and he, but he actually he was a slippery character, and he uh, escapes dressed as a woman and made it back to New York. And, but Andre's fate was far different. Instead, Washington ignores the resolution on the books that says, um, enemies of the sort shall be tried by court-martial. Instead, he does his own thing. He creates a military commission. And military commission sometimes mirrors a court-martial, but it doesn't have to. There, there is no right to due process. It really is at the whims of the commander to determine whatever rules that he wants. He can. Um, it's seen as sort of a, a quick and dirty way to punish the accused. They're not even looking to see if this man is guilty. They're thinking, what punishment does he deserve? And it's sort of assume that he's guilty. So Andre, he receives, um, a, I shouldn't even call it a trial, but a two-day trial in which they basically read um, some evidence, a bunch of hearsay against him. And he stood, uh, they say, defenseless and friendless. And he doesn't even have a chance to confront his accusers. Sure enough, he's hanged. Washington, he fell for this young Andre because he realized that the, the real enemy was Arnold. And this, this, this young man, who was very, a very likable character, he was just sort of caught um, in this sordid mess. And but at the same time, Washington felt very strongly that his job, his role as the American commander in chief was to defend the nation. And he needed to send a very strong signal that those who, who, who crossed him and, and attacked or potentially harmed his people, they would be punished severely. So when I was, we were just talking about this, about the, the title of the book, it's called Blood of Tyrants. and I. I, I gave it that title after the, the famous Jefferson line, uh, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, which I find very startling um, if, you, if you think about it. I, I think that the founding fathers um, and the whole founding generation in general, they sought to create the government that we have now and the constitution that we still, that we still use to spare us of the bloodshed that they endured they wanted to create a democratic republic where the people were protected. So they want to give the, the presidency the power to protect us from foreign tyrants, but not so much power that he could become a tyrant himself. Thank you, I look forward to questions and hope to work in more stories. Great, uh, well let me say a few words really following on Logan's presentation. Um, I, d I wrote a blurb for the book. It is quite a page turner. Uh, you know, books about George Washington, what's not to like about that? Uh, and it's, it, it really is quite, a, quite an excellent page turner. 
But uh, the reason I supervised it as a paper and the original impetus of the whole project was to think about uh, the Commander-in-Chief Clause has been a focal constitutional argument for a number of important cases. The steel seizure case, that was one of President Truman's legal justifications relying on an opinion by Robert Jackson, who was then on the court, but when he was with FDR, for the proposition that the Commander-in-Chief Clause gave the President, in time of war, some authority to confiscate property on American soil. For a war that was not being fought on American soil, unlike the Revolution. Uh, so we've seen it as long ago, an important uh, moment in the steel seizure case. And we've continued to see it in the war on terror. And most recently, we've seen it on the debates over the uh, President Obama's continued engagement in the Libyan hostilities, apparently contrary to the plain meaning of the War Powers Resolution, which Harold Coe of our law school thinks is constitutional. But as he told my class, he said, uh, but it's not constitutional as to all applications. And apparently, uh, the Obama administration felt that it would be unconstitutional for Congress to provide too many limits on the president's power to conduct hostilities against uh, Libya. Now, where those are, we don't really know. So the Commander-in-Chief Clause is actually a very important constitutional provision. And Logan's project, I think, is the first one to actually give us some legal purchase on what might have been the original meaning of the Commander-in-Chief Clause. Because when this was drafted at Philadelphia, I think the only Commander-in-Chief they had known was George Washington. Absolutely. They certainly did not have George III in mind. <laughs> they, they did not have they were not even, happy with him. even governors in mind. The governors were often the heads of the militias in the various states. That was also not their model. Uh, but instead, their model if they had one, and they probably did, was George Washington, who, and one of the many things that Logan's book does in wonderful detail, uh, it really does give you an idea not just of the um, fact that George Washington was universally acclaimed and admired, but some of the reasons he was universally acclaimed and admired. He was not a very successful general uh, at any point in his career. Uh, he was not, um, a, an attention grabber. He was not a self-publicist. And be partly because of, as well as notwithstanding all of that, he became this universally admired figure and was really a model for the Commander-in-Chief Clause. Uh, so I think it, it's extraordinarily relevant, both as a constitutional matter and thinking about the, the, the either the original meaning or the ongoing meaning of the Commander-in-Chief Clause, to know something about the experience that actually produced this clause and this exemplar. And then I think, as everybody expected, George Washington was then the first president and the first commander in chief <laughs> under Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. Now, I think there are, uh, you have to read the book um, to get the full flavor of this, though Logan has given you this wonderful story about the, the uh, court martial and the military commissions. Um, I think. Here are three themes that recur in the book. And the book does have bearing, um, and this is a good reason to read it as well, if you want to uh, talk about issues of torture or military commissions, which are contemporary issues, and which did have parallels during the Revolution when Washington was commander in chief. Uh, and he did take liberties uh, to torture, what we would today consider torture, uh, some of the enemy soldiers that had fallen into his hands. Uh, and he did, on some occasions, deploy military commissions rather than court-martials uh, to um, uh, even execute uh, um, spies and uh, other such. And I think that's very interesting. But I think there are three broader lessons that recur throughout the book. Uh, the one that struck me the most, um, and that I think remains relevant today as a structural matter, uh, is that um, there was a was an operative Congress for most, though not entirely all, of George Washington's tenure as Commander-in-Chief. And I was very struck, uh, and you could even write another book on this, at how utterly respectful Washington was of the instructions that he got from Congress. Uh, so th this is uh, someone who was uh, an often an aggressive, 
He was not bashful about using the power he'd been given. Um, and he, he also followed this approach during his presidency. He was very interested in the views of the Continental Congress. He was very respectful when the Continental Congress passed directives, uh, and he generally followed them. And this book is a wonderful example of what a Republican, small r Republican theory, such as what animated the revolution itself and the principles of the Constitution after the revolution, what that might mean for the commander in chief. And there's a certain degree of humility uh, that Washington um, displayed uh, as commander in chief uh, toward the directives of the Continental Congress. And I might add, there w this is the same point, there was also an extraordinary amount of humility that Washington displayed as regards the law of nations. So even when he would be delegated uh, discretion by the Continental Congress, for, uh, there's a wonderful treatment of plunder. And the caricature we all have of plunder is that in, you know, in 18th and 19th centuries, this is what armies did. Well, according to Logan's account, not so much the Continental Army. And indeed, General Washington, I'm remembering this correctly, please correct me, Logan, uh, uh, on more than one, uh, would execute his own people for engaging in plunder contrary to his instructions. In other words, uh, taking food, property, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the opposite of the steel seizure case. Uh, this is not only where he was authorized by the Continental Congress to take food and property and did not, uh, but uh, 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 in deference to what he considered either the law of war or the, what the law of war should be, General Washington um, uh, stayed his hand. Uh, so I think that is very remarkable, and I think that's the first remarkable thing about this account, which I think helps us understand the original meaning of the Commander-in-Chief Clause uh, and provides some lessons for thinking about it going forward. The country has changed, war has changed. Uh, second point. The second point, which I think is also very interesting, uh, is that if you are the Commander-in-Chief, Washington provides the first example, and it will be followed by subsequent examples, of the inherent dynamism uh, that uh, comes with being the commander in chief. Uh, in other words, you can have the law of war, you can have directives from the Continental Congress, you can have even agreements on the part of Washington and his own generals, but the conditions of the battlefield, the conditions of